Okay, in this video we're continuing our work in Unit 2. This is our third week and this is uh, the first lesson of the week. <clears throat> the handout in your packet that begins this week is just a series of practice problems associated with derivatives. So I'm going to work through a, a handful of these problems, not all of them, um, since the solution set is provided to you, uh, but at least a handful of them so that you can see my approach and maybe um, learn a, a new technique or two. So we'll do number one here, uh, find the equation of the line tangent uh, to the function at the given point, and our answer should be in slope-intercept form. So we've been doing this for a while now, and hopefully you're getting really good at finding derivatives that you can do this very quickly. But let's keep in mind that we do need a derivative first, so we'll call this 3x squared minus 2x. So this derivative equation will tell me the steepness of the line at any given point. The derivative that we're evaluating is going to be evaluated at an x value of negative 1. So when we substitute a negative 1 into this expression, we should be able to compute the slope at that point. And so at the coordinate negative 1, 0, we have a slope of 5. Let's see if that makes sense. Negative 1, comma, 0, that's this point here. So to have a slope of 5, that seems pretty reasonable. So the last thing we have to do now is use the point-slope formula and substitute our known values. And then we can simplify into slope-intercept form. So if we have a uh, point here and a y-intercept at positive 5, then the straight line between those two points uh, should represent the whoops, should represent the line tangent at negative 1, 0. That looks pretty good. And so of course in this example we do have a graph to look at, uh, you know, to verify our findings. Uh, this is ultimately the answer that we're going after. Uh, but what if, what if the graph wasn't provided? Would you be as confident in your answer? Um, let's start number four here. We don't have a picture of this graph. You may have an idea of what it would look like, but again, it doesn't matter. We should be able to establish the tangent line at this particular point. Now I like number four because it is a quotient of uh, two other functions, so we'll use the quotient rule. And I wonder if you've practiced the quotient rule enough to be able to utilize it without writing your mini functions off to the side. I'm going to give this one a try. So I'm going to use Leibniz notation here for the practice. We've got dy dx, which is the derivative of this function, and then the low function times the derivative of the high function minus the high function times the derivative of the low function all divided by the low function squared. So that phrase that I was saying to myself was low d high minus high d low over low low. And it may be worthwhile to clean this up just a little bit. So I'll distribute here and I'll have an 8x squared. I'll distribute here minus 8x and then we've got minus 4x squared in the numerator. Um, just to save some room I'll erase this after I combine these two. So 8x squared minus 4x squared is 4x squared. And then the denominator I'm not going to mess with. It's almost, almost never beneficial to um, simplify to expand or combine like terms in the denominator. So this is dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x, and we need to utilize dy dx and evaluate it at a given y coordinate. And we can indicate that with this vertical bar and an x equals at the bottom of it, and we're evaluating this at, at x equals 3. So 4 times 3 squared minus 8 times 3, 4 times 3 minus 4 squared. And I'm going to use a calculator off screen to compute this. 
and this simplifies to 3 sixteenths. I'm going to leave that as a fraction instead of the decimal, 0.1875. I just like the look of it better. Well, now that we have an x coordinate, a y coordinate, and a slope, then we can utilize our point slope formula. y minus 9 eighths equals the slope 3 sixteenths times x minus 3. And a little bit of effort to clean this up would go a long way. So we've got 3 sixteenths x minus 9 sixteenths. And if I add uh, 9 eighths to both sides, that would be like adding 18 sixteenths to both sides of the equation. So I'll just go ahead and note that plus 18 sixteenths. And I have to think of it this way to have a common denominator when combining with 9 sixteenths which interestingly is uh, 9 sixteenths, positive 9 sixteenths. So we've got y equals 3 sixteenths x plus 9 sixteenths. And there's our equation of our tangent line. And that's the equation of the tangent line through this point and this point only. The equation would be different through any other tangent line. So in the next pair of problems, um, the equations are pretty simple, but what's kind of interesting here is that the equation is asking you to find points where the tangent line to the function is horizontal. So when you're done with this, we need to see coordinates as an answer. So as far as the derivative goes, that's super easy to calculate. And we know that the tangent line would be horizontal when this derivative is equal to zero. So when we subtract 4 and divide by 4, we get a solution of negative 1. But that's not where we're going to stop. Remember, we want the point or the coordinate. So we know that this will happen when x is equal to negative 1. Uh, but we need to substitute this back in to the original equation. 2 times negative 1 squared plus 4 times negative 1 plus 1. That's the equation that's going to give us the y coordinate when x is equal to negative 1. In this case, it uh, computes out to be negative 1 as well. So to answer this problem, we know that the tangent point will level off at an x value of negative 1. And at that x value of negative 1, we have a y value of negative 1 as well. You should be able to do that for number 6, as well as other equations that are perhaps even more, uh, more complicated. And I tossed in questions like 7 and 8 just as a reminder of this phrase, instantaneous rate of change. We haven't seen that in a little while. Uh, but let's just remind ourselves that instantaneous rate of change, rate of change just means slope. And now that we're talking about an instantaneous rate of change rather than an average rate of change, the instantaneous part just reminds us that we're talking about the slope of a tangent line. So uh, much like we've done already, and I won't work through these two either, um, just find the derivative and use the derivative to find the slope of the line when x is equal to uh, negative 4 in this case, and when x is equal to negative 1 in that case. Questions like 9 and 10 are designed to um, really test your uh, recollection of our derivative rules. In part one of number nine, we're told that h1 of x, so uh, the function named h of x, and this is the first h of x, and we've got another separate function in part two. That's why they're using the subscripts here. But h of x is defined as the sum of f of x plus g of x, and our job is to find h prime at one. Let's just remind ourselves here for this first function, h prime of x would be equal to f prime of x plus g prime of x because h was defined as the sum of two functions. If I want the derivative of h, then I find the derivative of each um, function and add them together. So when we evaluate h1 prime at the number 1, that would be just like evaluating f prime at 1 and g prime at 1 as well. So uh, I don't have any idea what the functions are, but I do have this table over here that helps me. Uh, f prime at 1 is equal to 2, 
and uh, g prime at 1, g prime at 1 is also equal to 2. So uh, h prime, h sub 1 prime uh, at 1 would be the sum of 2 plus 2, or in other words, 4. h prime at 1 is equal to 4. And you could do the same thing with part two. Um, the second h function is defined as the difference between f and g. And we know that the sum or difference rule for derivatives implies that we can add the derivatives or subtract the derivatives. This, of course, would be different if there was a multiplication sign or a division sign between our two functions. And this problem wasn't set up to be a product or quotient rule, but let's see if we can complete part one um, using this new, uh, this new change. Well, h1 of x, if I want its derivative, and I know that h1 is made up as, uh, of the product of two functions, well, I've got to use the product rule. So it, that means to take the derivative of the first function, so that would be f prime of x, and multiply it by the second function, untouched, and then add to that the first function, f of x, times the derivative of the second function. And, of course, to evaluate h1 prime at 3, then we need f prime at 3, we need g at 3, we need f at 3 and g prime at 3. So f prime at 3 appears to be equal to 1. g at 3 appears to be 1 as well. Then f evaluated at 3 is 2. And g prime evaluated at 3 is zero. So without having a graph to look at, without knowing what the equations themselves are, we now know the steepness of h1 prime at 3, or I'm sorry, this we know the steepness of h1, the function h1 at 3, due to knowing its derivative, or at least using the chart to compute the derivative. So that's kind of an interesting pair of practice problems. I would recommend that you try those. And then um, on part two on number 10, change that to a quotient rule and see what you can do with that. If you've got questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Stop by my room or send me a message and we can chat about it. And uh, with the next big chunk of questions, uh, we're being asked to differenti differentiate each function with respect to x. And so differentiate, if you haven't picked up on it already, just means to find the derivative. And all of these have x as our independent variable. So uh, when we have y equals, we can call the derivative y prime. If we wanted to, uh, we could call it dy dx. And that would be just fine as well. It's good to get in the habit of learning all the different uh, vocabulary. Um, descriptions. Uh, but that first group of four problems isn't all that interesting, so we'll keep moving on. It's when we get down to 19 that the derivatives become pretty interesting. Uh, but before we jump, um, jump down to number 19, let's take a look at 15 through 18 real quick. Uh, hopefully you've seen this notation already. Uh, this is Leibniz notation for finding the second derivative. And let's not forget that the second derivative just simply means to find the derivative of the first derivative. So when we get into implicit differentiation a little bit later this week, you're going to notice that I use this notation, d dx, and I'm essentially applying that to both sides of the equation. I've done this in the past before, but I haven't emphasized it. But I'm going to do it now just to really illustrate why we're using this particular notation. Now if I apply uh, d dx to both sides of the equation, that's essentially me finding the derivative of y on the left hand side, which we don't really know. We don't know the steepness of y in terms of y. We know the steepness of y in terms of x. 
Now since x is the variable that's being used inside of this grouping symbol, I can find the derivative with respect to x. This d dx can be computed, and I'll get negative 15x to the fourth power. I'll give myself a little bit of room here. And I'm going to apply the d dx command to both sides of the equation again. So we've got d dx on both sides of the equation. And here again, um, I can't find the derivative of y. I can't find the derivative of the derivative of y either because of this variable. We, we can't find the derivative of y with respect to x because those two variables disagree. So in a sense, I'm going to combine these two fractions. And I'm using air quotes when I say the word fraction here because they're not really fractions. These are called differentials, and they, they aren't exactly fractions. But a lot of times, we can treat them as such. So I'm taking the uh, derivative of the derivative of y. So this is kind of where this uh, d squared y notation comes from. You can almost see that like, like as if we were multiplying these two together. So we've got this d squared y in the numerator. And then in the denominator, it's like we have two of these dx's. So uh, the reason why we've got the square after the d but before the y in the top, well, that's, that tends to make sense. And in the bottom, it's almost as if we've got this group dx that's being squared because I have a pair of these dx's. And that's a very loose and general description of our notation here, but it seems to suffice for, for what we're doing in this, in this instance. So feel free to um, uh, resonate with that or feel free to rely on that, if you will, to help understand your notation of the second derivative uh, when using Leibniz notation. Now on the right hand side, again, this group, this equation is written in terms of x, so I certainly can find the derivative in terms of x. I know a derivative rule for this because the variables match the uh, variable of differentiation. So uh, we'll go ahead and multiply this 4 times negative 15 and reduce the power, and we've got ourselves the second derivative. And if we wanted to find the derivative again, the derivative with respect to x and the derivative with respect to x, I know the problem doesn't ask for it, but we could if we wanted to. Uh, here's where we get a d times d squared, which would give us our d cubed y. And now, if again, you're imagining that this group dx is being squared, well, I've got three of those dx's, so we'll call this dx cubed. And this notation indicates the third derivative. And we're now talking about negative 180 times x squared. And there's our third derivative, and so on and so forth, should we decide to do that. I'm not asking you to do that in this set, but now you know in case you choose to. So um, as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, these, uh, these um, equations, 19 and, and beyond, uh, they get kind of interesting. Um, but I selected 19 and 20 so that you can practice the product rule for differentiation. And 21 and 22, you can use the quotient rule that we practiced and learned about last week. And then for number 23, and I think beyond, I bet the chain rule is going to be used. Now, on number 19 and, and 20, you certainly could distribute this negative x to the fifth into these two terms. And that's that's your prerogative. You could do that if you were asked to do that on a test. Um, but just to illustrate the product rule for extra practice and perhaps a chance to do this without writing down our many functions, uh, let's kind of remind ourselves that we've got this first function and the second function. And in order to find the derivative of y with respect to x, we need the derivative of the first function, which is negative 5x to the fourth, times the second function, untouched, plus the first function, untouched, negative x to the fifth, times the second function's derivative, so negative 25x to the fourth. And for this video and for this series of um, problems, I would go ahead and tell you to stop here with the work, I would actually I would actually indicate that this is our final answer. Yes, I know we can distribute and we'll most likely be able to combine some like terms, but this is a good place to stop for this particular question because it's my way of verifying that you are using the product rule correctly. Um, if you were to take this farther or 
uh, maybe skip part of this step in favor of getting to a solution that's already simplified, uh, it'd be harder for me to see if you truly understand the product rule. Now, of course, if you had labeled f off to the side as negative x to the fifth, and f prime as negative 5x to the fourth, and then g as negative 5x to the fifth plus 4, and then therefore g prime is negative 25x to the fourth. You certainly could have drawn your multiplication arrows here, your reminder of these cross products like we showed last week. And the results of these cross products generate these two groups as well. And so you would, you would end up with the same result as well. So again, we'll stop here for 19 and 20, even 21 and 22, after you establish the, the layout, if you will, of the quotient result, then you can go ahead and, and pause and uh, leave it as it is. We won't, we won't bother simplifying. And again, that's just going to save you on some, some algebra work. So let's, um, let's set up number 23 here. Actually, we'll probably work through this whole thing. Um, if I'm asking you to find the derivative here, um, I would certainly expect you to recogni recognize that we have this inner function and this outer function. And so the outer function is u to the fourth power, and the inner function is just the 2x to the fourth plus 1. And I haven't seen you much since you've learned the chain rule, so I don't know how many of you are using version 1 or version 2. Uh, I tend to lean towards, um, I believe it was version 2, where we don't use Leibniz notation. We just, we just find the derivative of the outer function and keep the inner function the same, and then multiply by the derivative of the inner function. Let me show you what I mean. I know that the outer function is 4 times something cubed, and the something on the inside right now is 2x to the fourth power plus 1. And to account for the function that's on the interior, we immediately multiply by the derivative of that interior function, which is going to be 8x cubed. Now here again, for the upcoming test, for just a question on, say, the chain rule or the product rule or the quotient rule, I would probably have you stop here. Because I don't want to test you again over the... Um, algebra that goes into simplifying this, I want to test you over your calculus knowledge. And right here, this is where the calculus stops. It's from here on in which we would rely heavily on algebra to simplify. So for these problems in this particular uh, set of practice, go ahead and stop after that first or second step where you've established the results of the, of, of the uh, derivative. For number 25, Let's remind ourselves that cosine is our outer function, and this 5x squared, there's an implied grouping symbol surrounding it. So if I use the um, chain rule, I need the derivative of the outside function, but I keep the inside function alone. So the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and the inside function I leave alone. Then I immediately multiply by the derivative of the inner function, 10x. Now, again, we could stop here. This is a good stopping point. But since we don't see these trig rules all that often, let me just remind you that the way we would clean this up is bring the 10x to the front with the negative 1 that's multiplying by sine. And we would actually report this as negative 10x sine of 5x squared. Um, you can show the parentheses or not. I tend to leave the parentheses here uh, unless it's a single term with um, uh, with no coefficient. So the questions through 28 are pretty much the same, but when we get down to 29, of course, uh, things get kind of interesting because we are using one of our inverse trig rules. Uh, so let's talk about 29 for a second. Um, I don't have this one memorized, so I'm looking off screen at my note card, and you could do the same. But I know that the derivative of sine inverse would be 1 over the square root of 1 minus something squared, x squared. Now, the x squared, in this case, the x that we're multiplying by, is the inner function. So we're going to write this as 2x to the fourth power. And then immediately after finding the derivative of the outer function, 
when we keep the inside function alone, we have to turn around and multiply by the derivative of the inner function, 8x to the third. And here again, there's not a whole lot of benefit into simplifying this if you want it to, however. Um, this 8 cubed, 8x cubed is like a fraction over 1. So we'll call this 8x cubed over the square root of 1 minus and again, not a big benefit to distributing this in, but we can if you'd like. Uh, now we've got 4x to the 8th power, and we've got a nice compact result. But again, I kind of like this for the test that's upcoming, even without, the, um, even without that division bar here. Um, we'll go ahead and stop here. This illustrates your understanding of the use of the product rule, I'm sorry, the chain rule, and the inverse trig function. And we're getting just a little bit short on time, so 31 and 32 are pretty much straightforward chain rule problems. Uh, let's take a look at number 33. This one's kind of interesting. Um, with number 33, I've got 5 to the power of x cubed. So this is my inner function and then I have this outer function, 5 to some power. So I, I'm going to use the chain rule again. And that's part of what this assignment's all about, whether you recognize uh, with, you know, whether to use a chain rule, product rule, quotient rule to make your life a little bit easier. So uh, again, inner function, outer function. Now the outer function reminds me, or is an example of this guy here. So the derivative of b to the x power, so something to the power of x. If you recall, that's the natural log of b times b to the x. And so that's just as an aside, this is that derivative rule we should have memorized. And so if I'm going to use the chain rule without writing down the preliminary work, let's see how that's going to appear. I need the derivative of the outer function, but I keep the inside function as it is. Well, this outer function's derivative would be the natural log of 5 times 5 to the power. Now, this power is the inner function untouched, so we'll call this x cubed. And then immediately we multiply by the derivative of the inside function, 3x squared. And this would be a good place to stop. And I think that's really all that you can do in this particular case. I know it's tempting to see uh, the number 3 as a coefficient and 5 as a coefficient, but you can't multiply the 3 times 5 because this is technically not a coefficient. This 5 is the base of an exponent. It cannot be combined with the 3. So even if you want it to simplify further, you really can't. And if I'm being perfectly honest, I would probably report this if, if it had to be cleaned up. Um, the natural log of 5 first, because that's a coefficient, that's just some number. Then 3x squared, because that's kind of like a polynomial's term. And then finally, 5 to the x cubed power last. Those three terms multiply together. This handout does include um, solutions, so hopefully you're able to check your work and verify the results that you've obtained. Now I'm looking at 33 just out of curiosity and they've even reported it in slightly different form than what I did. So uh, not a big deal. They do mean the same thing. Multiplication's commutative so we can indicate that out of order. I think with most of the other solutions the derivatives are computed first kind of like what I was suggesting and then simplified. So while you're working I think you'd want to check that first result Make sure you're good there, and then algebra would be needed to get to our final. If you've got any other questions, please let me know. Thanks for watching.